His favorite actor is Jack Nicholson, and one of his favorite movies is Once Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You might not know this about him, but he also pursued a acting career for about seven years. But after those seven years, he um, decided that this career path of al alcoholism is not for him. <laughs> so uh, he, uh, he decided that he'll stick to coding. So uh, what can I say? You should pay, uh, just pay special attention to this man uh, because um, uh, the thing he's going to be talking about will be in use in JavaScript for the upcoming years. So give a warm welcome to Tomasz Ducin. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, in this talk, we're gonna concentrate and focus on asynchronous programming in JavaScript. And that is two new keywords arriving to uh, the new version of JavaScript, and that is async await. Uh, together combined, they form uh, what we call async uh, functions. But before we dive deep into async await code, uh, we need to uh, briefly recall uh, what are the fundamentals? Uh, where does async await come from? And that is promises and generators. So my name is Tomasz Ducin. In my daily work, I design architecture and uh, implement enterprise scale uh, interfaces. Currently working for uh, Ivanti company, a new company in Warsaw uh, from the ITIL sector where we do uh, complex and very challenging applications for customers from all over the world. Um, so, uh, to get to the, uh, straight to the topic, the most important thing, the fundamental thing in JavaScript is understanding what is, uh, what is the function, wh what is the function execution, the function scope, right? This is the whole beginning of uh, talking about asynchronous programming. Uh, first, we need to understand when a function is uh, invoked synchronously and when is it called asynchronously, right? Understand uh, what is the difference between uh, a set timeout or a for each call, right? Is it going to go through the event loop or does this uh, run to completion rule uh, gets into the place, right? So that a function cannot be interrupted, right? When a function is started, it can either return or it can be interrupted like with an error, right? But it cannot be paused at this point. So having this in mind, uh, we can start coding. The first and most uh, basic approach is to use callbacks, but this does not really scale, right? If we use call only callbacks, we can uh, fall into the callback hell. Uh, for things that are repeatedly uh, happening in our application, we can use events, right? But this solution is still not really uh, easy to scale because events are like going in all directions. It's not really easy to debug and manage uh, code that is based on this approach. So at some point, uh, promises were introduced to JavaScript, but uh, I guess this is something that we are mostly familiar with, right? So how many of you understand promises? Okay, it's whole room brilliant. I expected that. So if we take promises and add them with generators, we get something that is called coroutines. A generator is a brand new type of function, uh, something that is different than a function, right? It has a slightly different execution model than a native JavaScript function. Together, they form coroutine. Coroutine is a replacement for a promise chain. It's a process of different steps that will be invoked asynchronously. If we have multiple coroutines talking to each other, right, within a single thread, right, JavaScript is single threaded. So if we have different processes talking to each other, we've got communicating sequential processes. And a small uh, evolution of coroutines is the main topic of, uh, um, of this talk, and it's async await. And to fill this gap that we've got here, it's going to be discussed within the next two uh, talks during today's conference, and that is reactive streams, which, as you can see, is a little aside because it does not really inherit from these things here, but it's still an approach to be both synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, okay, so not to uh, recall the basics of promises because we all know that. Let's talk about the limitations of promises. So the first limitation is that a promise represents a single item, right? So if something is meant to be repeated, right, a promise does not really fit into the picture. 
right? Um, that's one thing. We would have to create new promises. Another thing is that promises, promises are greedy. It means that if we have a promise, like in a variable or whatever, it's already running, right? And there is no way to cancel it. Uh, comparing to Rx, JS, uh, the streams where we can actually cancel a subscription before an event uh, appears, right? In promises, if we register a then, and, we uh, and the promise has not uh, settled yet, we cannot cancel it. There is just no way to do it. Uh, then we've got values that are unavailable outside the chain, right? A promise results with a value, right? It, the value becomes available for the then next steps, and we can modify them so that become uh, available for the next steps, and so on and so on. But there is no possibility to access a value outside the chain, right? If we do it outside the chain, then we are in the synchronous right thread, right? So we, we cannot access them. There is no way to do it with promises. And finally, when we do a promise chain, we always access the previous value. But what if we wanted to access uh, the, bef uh, the values before the previous one, right? So the first or the second or the third out of five steps, right? There is, again, no way to do it in a gentle way. So um, talking about coroutines and SGO8 is uh, addressing these uh, kind of uh, limitations. So this, is, uh, this uh, code snippet here is um, displaying just sequential processing using promises. Sequential promises uh, processing is achieved using just a uh, promise chain, so that the output of async op1 becomes the input of async op2, output of async op2 becomes input of the next step, and so on and so on. So basically, one operation needs to finish before the next one can start. After this finishes, the next one can start, and so on and so on. We can wrap such uh, promise operate uh, like the sequence of the operations within a function so that we can encapsulate a little bit of our business logic with a function and call it from outside on the other hand we can do parallel processing right so instead of chaining we can just start the operations here we gather them in variables and we just call some kind of promise aggregate like here promise all so if we have promises if we have a promise in a variable it means that it's already running. If we have more promises, then it means already, even if we don't do a promise all yet, it's already running par in parallel, right? So here we are calling promise all, um, meaning that it will wait for all promises to resolve, then it can go to the next step, and we can again wrap it with a uh, function so that it becomes available as an encapsulated business logic. But apart from all, which we all use uh, on a daily basis. There is also race, any, and some, which are a different kind of aggregates. Race, which is also available in ES6 standard, uh, it's gonna uh, settle once any of the promises settle, right? So the first one that uh, resolves will resolve the whole race, and this is the same with any, right? But if the first one fails here with race, the whole race fail, right? And this is different with any because this one will wait until any of them will uh, just try to succeed, right? So with all, uh, all of them have to succeed. And once all of them fail, this uh, condition is not possible anymore, right? With race, if the first fails, then the whole thing fail. If the first thing uh, succeeds, then the whole thing succeed. With any, if the first thing fails, then there is just at least one needs to be uh, to succeed, right? So the, uh, so the condition is still possible, right? So once all of them fail, then the whole thing fails because the condition of at least one uh, successful is not possible anymore. And finally, sum is a generalization over any. So it means at least n, at least two, at least three, at least four of all the promises. So this is about promises. Uh, let's go further to the yield keyword, right? So when we're driving a car, uh, whether it's yield or whether it's stop road sign, it means that we need to uh, give the control to the, to the uh, vehicles uh, on the other side of the road, right? So we need to stop and we give the control to somebody else, right? And this is uh, how generators are working in uh, JavaScript. So on the left-hand side, we've got just a function that returns an array, right? And on the right-hand side, we've got 
a generator, you can note here the asterisk here and the yield uh, keyword. Yield is somehow similar to return, right? But return keyword is just terminating the function, is just ending it. And yield is just giving away one item at a time. This means that if I invoke this function, I need to allocate entire thing in the memory, right? If it was not three items, but let's say three million items, it would be a huge amount of RAM allocated already in our computer. Whether generator is just allocating one item and returning it to the other side, right? So the memory consumption is a lot smaller. Uh, the whole idea of generators is to be lazy, right? So that at one time, I'm working only on one value, right? This is, uh, this is the key idea behind uh, generators and iterators. And know that they're both synchronous, right? So if we are invoking just a function, it has to finish so that we can proceed with another things. And with generators, we're immediately getting into the function, right? But there is no event loop going on uh, behind. And we've got a common abstraction that is the for off loop from ES6 that is just using anything that is iterable. An iterator, a product of calling a generator, is an iterable, an array is an iterable, and we've got many other uh, types of iterables available in, uh, f in JavaScript since ES6, right? So how this thing is working is that we've got this generate function over here, and we've got the uh, var iter that is just an instance of this generator, what we call an iterator, something that we can just iterate step by step item uh, by the item. So we're creating the generator, uh, we are, uh, at first, this generator does not get invoked uh, yet, right? So we are calling this console log one dot outside, which gets displayed here in this JSFill uh, demo on the right-hand side. And we are calling iter dot next, right? Which means now, au iterator, give me one item. So this guy, which was asleep, he wakes up and he does the code, right, doing this console log one inside until he finds a yield. Yield will simply return the item uh, out uh, to the enclosing scope. And after this yield, he goes back to sleep, right? So this is the moment, the yield keyword is the moment, then the control is moved to the other side, right? So the control goes back here. This generator is not finished. It's Let's say it's asleep. So we're carrying on with the console log.2 uh, outside, and then we're doing iter next. So we're waking this guy up, and this is the place, the yield is the place that he'll wake up and just carry on continuing the code. So we can have a lot of logic here, and a lot of scope uh, variables and memory and data uh, that, is just, uh, snap, uh, that is just a memory snapshot here. Um, so we're doing console log2 uh, outside, which is displayed here. We are doing yield, so this is the place that the generator will uh, go uh, back to sleep again, and we're moving the control here uh, to this iter.next, and we're carrying on with the console 3 outside, which is uh, finishing this code snippet. Note that uh, this generator is not terminated yet, right? It's waiting to be called again, right? It did not reach uh, the ending curly brace, and it did not reach the return, right? So here it's not used anymore, but it's not, um, it's not closed. Um, the thing about generators is that it does not really comply to the run to, completion uh, run to completion rule, which we know from functions. Run to completion means that a function needs to finish before anything other can be done in the next uh, turn of the event loop, right? A generator can just stop after there is a yield and it just stays in the memory, right? So this is a completely different type of a function execution. And actually, um, um, JavaScript community is not yet fully aware of how much we can do with generators, right? And one of the examples of what we can do with generators is coroutines, combining promises and generators, right? The idea is that just as with promises, we are going to start immediately executing a generator Right? But when we yield, we yield only promises. Right? So if I'm waiting for an operation to finish, I will use the possibility of a generator to stop, to pause, right? to suspend, so it's going back to sleep. But I'm already assigning a then, uh, a registering a then callback. So when this promise gets resolved, 
I'm gonna, uh, when this resolves or rejects the same way for a positive and for the negative uh, way of the execution, um, it's gonna uh, resume the generator. It's gonna call next, right? So a then will call a next, right? Um, so uh, it will call next and it will carry on until uh, again it will yield another promise and the promise will have a then with calling next so it will be a next then next then some kind of a loop right that will just keep on this generator uh, running right so what coroutines is trying to achieve is try to write a synchronous code in a synchronous manner so basically when we had a chain of promises we can get rid of all this then function then function and passing parameters uh, to the functions, we can concentrate on the logic of the asynchronous code. It's going to be linear, but it's going to be executed in an asynchronous manner using promises and generators. So, the way to do sequential processing is basically to have all the things going on one by one, right? This async op1 is still just a promise, right? And here this yield uh, imagine like in a movie, uh, there is a bad character that gets his victim and he just like gets his heart out of him, right? He just pulls, there's a bad guy, right? Uh, killing his victim. And this is what the yield keyword is doing with a promise, right? Remember, in promises, we could not access the value of a promise outside the promise chain, right? It was not possible. And here, the yield keyword is taking the promise and is just pulling the value out out of the promise, out of the scope. That was not possible with promises. So basically, here we've got var v1 equals yield async op. This yield is where the genera uh, generator will pause on the promise being still pending. When it resumes, uh, when the uh, promise gets settled, it will uh, go uh, to run back again. And the value will be um, assigned to the variable v1. So we continue like this, we will stop on async op2, which accepts the previous value, and then we will go to async op3, which accepts uh, v2 as the previous parameter, and so on and so on. So basically, a yield is a moment that this coroutine will stop. So this sequential up here is a generator, right? It's just a generator, uh, it knows nothing about promises. In order to make this promise generator, promise, generator, environment working, we need to wrap the sequential within an async function. This async, let's not uh, discuss what it is right now. We'll see that in a moment. But basically, this is a closure that will just wrap this generator within this async promise generator environment, right? So we've got sequential processing the same way we had it before. We can encapsulate it within a function so that we can uh, call it from outside. So this is just a replacement for uh, promise chains. Uh, if we wanted to do parallel processing, it's exactly the same way as we had with uh, aggregates and promises. So basically we are starting uh, all the operations here. Note there is no yield keyword. So each of these functions, each, so each of these calls are returning a promise. So basically at this point we've got just four promises inside our scope, right? So if we've got four promises it means they're already running in parallel. Note that if I've got a yield and a promise it will stop here. I don't have a yield so it's not a value, it's just a promise and it's just synchronously running here until I do the yield. So I get a promise, I pull a value out, then I do plus, and again I do a yield. So this yield and the promise expression, this ex expression is meant to return a value of what this promise should resolve uh, with. And uh, error uh, handling is done in a way that we can inject errors into generators so that this scope will just throw as a normal function would throw. And we can also uh, encapsulate it with a uh, function which returns a promise so that we can use it from outside, make it reusable throughout our application. And basically, this is the idea behind coroutines, right? We can have linear code, right, looking alike synchronous, but is executed in an asynchronous um, manner. So if you were um, trying to figure out what is this async thing, then this is just a couple of lines that do the right thing, obviously. Um, so 
<laughs> we're not going to discuss that, but basically this is this next, then, next, then loop. You can see there is a function that is just going to be called recursively, right? So we don't care about that. This is provided uh, by any kind of library vendor. It might be this async uh, couple of lines. It might be Bluebird coroutine. It might be a library called co, C-O, right? They, bo uh, they all provide this kind of implementation. Also, you might be familiar with Redux Saga, which is uh, based on this coroutine thing. So a small step from this point is that you might be wondering, like, why should I care about this async kind of environment? Why wouldn't it be introduced like a built-in uh, native thing in a browser? So a thing that is uh, has already been accepted for the upcoming version, ES8 or ES2017, whatever we call it, is async functions. So basically, what we've just learned about coroutines is exactly async await, just with a small uh, replacement. So instead of having this asterisk here, we write async before the function, async keyword before the function keyword, and instead of uh, uh, yield, we're just doing await, and that's all. And that's the whole logic of coroutines. It's basically the same way. Async um, coroutine is something that we have to implement using this funny function we have just seen. And async await is just built into the browser. It's already available in, uh, in uh, uh, most browsers, as well as uh, Babel and TypeScript and all the uh, popular uh, technology stacks we've got. So sequential processing will be the same. So we're going to stop on the await, right? So this is where we are taking the promise. This uh, call should return a promise. Just pull out the value so that we've got it here and do it again, and do it again. We can encapsulate the thing the same way. If we want to have it sequential, then that's the way. And finally, we can have parallel processing. So this is, again, very similar to what we've had. So we're starting one operation, and another one, and another one, and another one. We have a collection of four uh, promises, meaning they're running in parallel. And on the last, uh, uh, on the last line, we're doing await, right? So this await will take the promise, pull the value out, so this expression will return a value. So we can do here. We can do any kind of uh, operation, any kind of calculation we would like to have it, right? So promise.all or promise.race, they always had to introduce this new step, and we could process these values within a new step, right? Here, here we can just await a promise to get the value out and write this code immediately, right? So this is a lot uh, easier uh, to deal with. And again, we can write it, uh, uh, wrap it with a function. So a thing that we have already uh, told about promises is we cannot access uh, the values from the previous steps of a promise chain, right? We've got only to the very previous step, but I cannot go like two steps backward value, three steps backward value, and so on. Uh, take a look at this, that here we've got just a function scope, right? So I have all the variables in the scope. They're all available. I could do like if statements, while statements. I could do whatever logic I could put here. And I've got all these things uh, available here, right? I could also put some synchronous code here, and it doesn't matter. Just remember that the await or the yield is the place that we will stop. But if I wanted to access the previous values, like these three ones, within a promise chain, it would be very cumbersome to do. There is a dirty hack that we could just break this chain and wrap it with a function and inject a value as a function parameter so that I can access the previous step and the value from the function parameter, right? But this is just uh, a dirty hack that we should not use. This is the way forward, right? Um, and uh, nothing is perfect. And so are, <laughs> and, and generators are not perfect, and the same applies to coroutines and async await, because coroutines and async await simply inherit from generators. So in generators, we cannot yield from nested functions, right? So here we've got a async function. It could be a generator, a yield also as well, it doesn't matter. And here we've got a nested function that we have a collection, we are doing a for each, and just executing a function over each item and we would like to await or yield using this inner function, right? We cannot do this. Um, 
the idea of this example, let's imagine that you have a book and you have chapters, right? Uh, for each chapter, we've got a URL. We've got a URL collection. We want to fetch them uh, in parallel, right? And when they arrive, I would like to, uh, you know, for each is executed uh, synchronously, right? So it will be one function, then another, then another. So I would like the first one to stop on the promise until it's resolved. When Once it resolves, I will get the HTML out of this because await will pull out the value, right? So I access the HTML um, attribute of this response. And then I just want to add this HTML to page, right? So I want to stop on, uh, on this synchronously invoked first element. Then once it gets executed, then I go to the second step. I'm awaiting. Maybe it could already... Um, the response uh, could have got back to the browser. Maybe yes, maybe not, I know. Uh, but I would like to stop here so that I would stop at the first chapter so that it gets rendered, stop at the second chapter so that it gets rendered, and this way I could have the right order of all the chapters. So this code makes a lot of sense and it's really beautiful. The problem is that it throws a syntax error, right? And the reason is that we cannot await and we cannot yield from within a nested function. And actually, it makes a lot of sense. Imagine how call stack looks. We are going into the render chapters uh, function. So we are having this render chapters function uh, on the stack, right? And then I'm going to the for each thing. So there is another thing put on the call stack, right? And now, if I'm doing a uh, this one, the render chapter is an async function. So I could uh, await only an async function. If I want to await an just a typical function, this is just an arrow function, right? So which one is going to be yielded or awaited? This one or this one, right? This would not make sense. Like, I couldn't, being in this function, I could not s uh, pause this one, right? Because of the call stack structure, right? So this is the reason that we cannot, um, we cannot yield or await nested functions, right? Uh, so we might just turn this function, arrow function, into an async arrow function, right? To make it work. Unfortunately, this will run in parallel, right? Because having already a list of promises, we are s uh, synchronously uh, running this once it gets resolved, just add HTML to the page, right? So synchronously, I'm s registering this operation, right? And I'm finished at this point, right? But now, the important thing is the order when the resp uh, in which the responses will get back to the browser, right? And this is non-deterministic. This is why this will be executed in parallel. Uh, the solution to this problem is to fall back again to promises, go, go back to the roots, where we have a list of promises that we want to do sequentially, and we just using array.reduce function to force uh, sequential execution. Uh, as you have already seen, we don't uh, only have the traditional async functions, we have al also um, async arrow functions. So this is exactly the same um, the same syntax. We can have implicit or uh, implicit return or explicit return. We can omit uh, the parentheses uh, if we have exactly one element. So this is just a uh, shorthand for writing functions, right? Uh, this works exactly the same way as promise resolve, right? Because an async function or a coroutine always has to return a promise, right? So if we have a function const square that is just for a given x, it's returning x squared, and we do this square dot five, this is exactly the same thing as we would have uh, promise dot resolve of 25, right? So square dot five uh, of five dot then console log output 25, right? So keep in mind, that an async function is not returning a value, or a coroutine is not returning a value, it's returning a promise that results with a value. So these were uh, async await, basically promises and generators, but uh, there is still some uh, progress going beyond what we have already seen. So a traditional iterator, when we call uh, iterator.next, we get this object value with a value and done, which is Boolean, like true false, right? So this is something that is synchronous. We might have an asynchronous iteration, right? So if we wanted to iterate, iterate on something lazily and 
asynchronously at the same time. So instead of value being available already, being available immediately, we could have uh, async iterator.next, which will return a promise that resolves with this uh, value and done. And this thing, this async iteration, is a stage three proposal uh, by, I guess, Dominic de Nicola. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, right? So this is very probable to arrive in upcoming versions of, uh, of JavaScript. And as we had for off loop, now we're going to have for await off loop, right? So we are going to iterate over an asynchronous thing, right? So here, let's say if you wanted to uh, do some kind of uh, server-side processing and we wanted to read lines, right? Uh, so that it's going to um, iterate, right? but with something that is available asynchronously, right? So we can just do this kind of um, accessing. Uh, and the very last step is, if we're um, considering like this await thing is very nice because it can uh, pull the value out from the promise, right? But the problem is that we need to wrap it with a async function, right? This a a everything has to be wrapped with async function and um, what could we do in order to avoid this limitation, right? So we could have um, we could have something that is called top-level await, right? So we can have an await keyword that is not wrapped with an async function, right? So we've got this delay to uh, thousand, so basically it's awaiting until two thousand uh, two thousand milliseconds are passed, right? We could have uh, await fetch, so we could just await um, a resource that is just asynchronously fetched uh, to, the, to the client, to the browser, or we could do any kind of I.O. operation inside Node.js, so we could just write files and we could await on writing these files and await on doing any kind of other processing, and that is not uh, wrapped with this async function, right? So this is very handy if we're doing this kind of especially I.O. processing. The problem on the other side is that if this is a module that is going to be uh, consumed by another module, right? So we can just await something, we can await and export, it doesn't really matter, or we could do even a pol uh, polyfill or ponyfill, doesn't matter, uh, on an array prototype method that does not exist yet, whatever. But if we consume this from within another module and we get to this import, the import statement is synchronous, right? So this guy, not being aware of this internal implementation here, he will get stuck, right? Because this import will get here and this await will make him wait, right? So at the step of importing modules, we could just get paused at this point, right? And this is why uh, top level await is called a foot gun because it's considered on one hand very useful, but also very dangerous. And this is how uh, Rich Harris, creator of Rollup, called it. So this is a matter of discussion whether it's going to arrive in JavaScript or not. So this is everything uh, I got for this presentation. Thank you very much.